Hello, everyone. Thank you for standing by. Welcome to today's webinar on high content, high throughput, cell health, and cell function assays. My name is Elisa Morales. I'm a senior product manager at LabSite, and I'll be your moderator today. Before we begin, I just have a few announcements. If you're experiencing any difficulty, technical difficulties during the webcast, please click on the Help widget. You can get immediate access to technical resources and information. The widget is, in, is the one marked with a question mark located at the bottom of the screen. During the presentation, all participants will be in listen-only mode. To ask presenters a question, you can do so at any time during the event. Please type in your questions in the Q&A window. The presenters will respond during the Q&A session. I would like to introduce our two speakers for today. Our first speaker will be Helen Ho. She's Field Application Scientist for IntelliSec Corporation. Our second speaker today will be John Lesnick, Application Scientist from LabSite. Helen, please begin. Thank you, Lisa, for that introduction, and thank you, everyone, for taking the time to attend today's webinar. Today, I would like to cover several topics during this webinar. I will be giving a brief introduction on high-throughput flow and how IntelliSight offers a complete solution to HTF. I will talk briefly about our no-wash assay kits, and finally, a case study done by one of our customers combining cell and bead-based assays all in one experiment. With high-throughput flow, we are harnessing all the powerful capabilities of a traditional cytometer, such as working with suspension cells, multiplex assays looking at various markers at the same time, and looking at different cell populations at the same time, looking at large number of samples to get more statistically relevant data. With HTF, you have the ability to work with no-wash assays since each event is interrogated at a time, plus the unique ability to look at dim and bright events together within a single assay due to a large dynamic range. This capability allows you to work with cells and beads together in a single experiment. HTF adds suspension samples to your screening capabilities, allowing you to work with many different types of samples, including lymphocytes, leukemia cells, and stem cells. You can work with multiplex beads and even adherent cells. The cells just need to be lifted off the plate. So IntelliSight offers the complete solution for high throughput flow. The first component we offer is the instrument. You can sample up to 10,000 samples per day. The system can work with three different plate formats, 96, 384, and even 1536 well plates. You can even use the LabSite Echo to do your sample prep to miniaturize your assay. The IQ screener can look at four fluorescent channels at a time and can be integrated with automation systems. The IQ combines three very powerful screening technologies, the plate reader, high content screener, and flow cytometer. With these three combinations, we are able to generate high content data very quickly. We can work with very low sample volume. The system is very easy to use and highly flexible. Plus, you can integrate this with a robotic arm to feed plates into the system. The IQ has a patented sampling technology. The system is continuously drawing samples, even when it's moving from well to well. This generates an air gap between each sample, and the software is able to deconvolve this continuous sample stream and assign it to the correct well. This is why we have very fast sampling time. It takes less than five minutes for a 96 well plate, less than 20 minutes for a 384 well plate, and less than 80 minutes for a 1536 well plate. The second component IntelliSight has to offer is the Foresight software. This software allows users to process data in real time. We can generate templates for routine screens, thus taking subjectivity out of the equation and allow better correlated data across the screen. The Foresight software has all the traditional flow analysis tools, but you can also generate color-coded heat maps, scatter plots, and histograms for an entire plate. You can also generate dose response curves. One of the newest features for Foresight is the profile mapping. Using Boolean logic, you can use multiple criteria to generate a profile for a hit. The software will identify which flow that meets these criteria and generate a hit list. You can use slider bars to make the modifications to these criteria and get real-time feedback on wells that meet these new criteria. 
The last component that IntelliSight has to offer are the multi-site reagent kits. These kits are fully optimized for the IQ screener. Most of these kits are mix and read and no wash protocol. Plus, the kits have very low assay volume, thus saving on samples. The kits offer a wide range of screening applications like cell health, genotox, T cell B cell function, and immunomodulation. Our kits and reagents include apoptosis, cell cycle, cell proliferation, membrane integrity, Q-beads to look at cytokine secretion, cell encoder, which allows you to barcode your cells, and micronucleus. One of our newer reagents is the cell proliferation dye. This dye comes in two different flavors, FL1 and FL4. You can add either one of these dyes to your existing assay. The way the dye works is that you initially stain your cells in a tube, then you wash away any dye that isn't bound to the cell. Then you seed the cells onto a plate. As the cells divide, the dye gets passed to the next generation at a diluted concentration. So as the cells divide, you get a decrease in intensity. You can monitor greater than six generation of cell division. The next reagent we have to offer is the membrane integrity dye, which allows you to monitor cell viability. The way this dye works is that when the cell membrane is intact, the dye cannot penetrate into the cell. However, if the membrane is compromised, the dye will be able to get into the cell and light it up. The dye comes in three different flavors, FL1, FL4, and FL3. FL1 and FL4 have very similar properties, but FL3 gives you an added bonus of being stable for up to 24 hours. The, the FL3 dye is fixable and is comp compatible with adherent cells such as HeLa and A549. You can multiplex the membrane integrity dye with some of our other reagents, such as proliferation and our apoptosis assay that looks at caspase and SN5 and mitochondria depolarization. You can also multiplex this dye with cell cycle and even with other QBs. One of our most popular kits is the QBs assay kit. This allows you to look at secreted cytokines. The bees are coated with a capture antibody that will capture the secreted protein. Then you come in with a fluorescently labeled detection antibody so you can measure how much of the protein has been captured by the bees. The bees are barcoded with a varying concentration and ratio of FL1 and FL4, thus allowing you to create up to a 30-plex assay. We offer a human, mouse, and rat panel. For more information, please visit our website at www.intellisite.com. The QB protocol is very simple. Our standard no-wash protocol is mixing 10 microliters of sample with 10 microliters of beads. Incubate for an hour and then add 10 microliters of detection reagent. Incubate for two hours and then read on the IQ, which takes about 18 minutes for a 384 well plate. All our analytes are fully characterized. We provide you with the lowest level of detection for each analyte and comparing a no-wash protocol with a single wash protocol. There are many benefits to our QB kits compared to other methods. We have a no-wash protocol. We are able to work with low sample volume. Our kit is high throughput, and you can even work with 1536 well plates if you want to further miniaturize your assay to save on sample and reagent. You can even mix the beads with cells to create a true multiplex assay. On that note, that leads me into my customer case study. One of our customers was interested in looking at PBMC stimulation with PHA to measure secreted cytokines, IL-2, interferon gamma, and TNF-alpha with the QB. On top of that, they wanted to monitor cell proliferation within the subpopulations of PBMC using CD3 and CD8 markers at a two-day and six-day period, and doing all this together with a no-wash assay protocol. You can say they're really trying to throw the kitchen sink into this experiment. The researchers started out with a source plate that contained the PVMCs that were cultured for 48 hours and treated with varying concentration of PHA across the plate. The first column was left empty as a negative control for the proliferation dye. Then the source plate was split. One assay plate contained the supernatant and PVMCs, and the other assay plate contained only the supernatant. The standard beads were included in each assay plate. The cells and beads were easily isolated by the forward and side scatter properties. 
With the QB identified, a singlet gate was drawn using the forward scatter height versus area. Then using the FL3 and FL4 channel, the three different bead populations were isolated. With the cells, a singlet gate was drawn using the same method as the bead. Then using FL1 and F versus FL4, the different cell populations of PBMCs were isolated using the CD3, CD8 immunomarkers. As part of validating the assay, various experiments were done. For example, the researcher had to make sure the PBMCs didn't affect the ability of the QBs to capture the secreted cytokines. As you can see here, with all three cytokines, the QBs were able to capture the secreted proteins with and without the presence of cells. Even the EC50 values were very similar. The QBs didn't interfere with the cell surface marker staining. With just the detection re reagent alone and with QBs, about 20% of CD3, CD8 positive were identified, and about 60% of the CD3, CD8 negative cells were identified. Once the researcher verified that various components of the experiment didn't affect each other, they were confident to move forward with this multiplex no-wash assay. At the two-day time point, the researcher was able to measure the presence of IL-2, interferon gamma, and TNF. They were able to get very nice dose response curves with an increasing concentration of PHA. At the two-day time point, the researcher was able to see very minimum amount of PBMC proliferation. From the highest to lowest concentration of PHA, they only saw about a 10% increase of cell proliferation. At day two, the researcher only saw a significant increase in cell proliferation with the different cell subsets. For CD3, CD8 positive cells, the highest level of PHA was only able to stimulate 20% of the cells to proliferate. At the six-day time point, the researcher was able to see interferon gamma and TNF-alpha production, but not IL-2. They speculate that at day six, IL-2 is either degraded or reabsorbed by the cells. At day six, the researcher was able to see PBMC proliferation. Up to 80% of the cells were proliferating at the highest concentration of PHA. For the different cell subsets, the researcher was able to observe cell proliferation and was able to generate really nice dose response curves. It is interesting to see that CD3, CD8 positive cells proliferated the most and CD, CD3 negative cells proliferated the least. With this assay, the researcher was able to multiplex cell and bead-based assays together. They're able to monitor how their compounds affect secretion of proteins and modulate cell proliferation within different cell subpopulations, all in one no-wash assay. Proving that the IQ screener and IntelliSight assay kits are very powerful tools for immunology-based discovery. Thank you, everyone, for attending my portion of the webinar. I hope you found it very informative, and at the, at the end of this webinar, I will be able to answer any questions you might have. On a side note, I would like to invite everyone to attend our educational webinar tomorrow, December 18th at 11 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. My colleague will be covering basic concepts in design and interpretation of multiplex assays. Please go to our website for more information. With that, I would like to hand over to John from LabSite to give his portion of the webinar on the ecosystem. Thank you. Thank you, Helen and Lisa, for having me today. I also want to give a special thanks to Pam Lowe for putting this webinar together. There's a lot of work that goes behind the scenes to uh, make this happen, so thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you for all making the time to participate in this webinar. We have some very exciting technology to share today, and I'm hopeful we can trigger some ideas that include our technology to help enable your current or future research objectives. So to this end, I want to take a few minutes to tell you a little bit about LabSight and give you a glimpse into our family of products. So LabSite was founded in 2000 and shipped its first liquid handler in 2003. We have instruments installed in all the top pharmaceutical companies, large and mid-sized pharma, biotech, and CROs. We're also fortunate to have a strong customer base in academic and research institutes worldwide. Our products are utilized in a wide range of applications, and we maintain very strong IP with a portfolio of over 60 patents. We offer several liquid handlers, and today I'll touch on the 555 and 525 models. The 555 dispenses increments of 2.5 nanoliter drops, and the 525 dispenses a larger drop, and this allows an increase in throughput and accommodates larger volume transfers. Our features include dynamic fluid analysis, which eliminates the need for you, the user, 
to calibrate the instrument and it is ready right out of the box. A key feature is the contact-free transfer. You eliminate tip cost, the risk of carryover, and contamination and potential loss of material binding to the tip plastic. The Echo Liquid Handler is capable of transferring any Echo Qualified Source well to any destination well. This is tremendously useful for tasks like cherry picking, multiplexing, and combination screening. This flexibility, coupled with its range of dispense volumes, enables direct dilution of reagents. An extension of this feature, often overlooked, is DOE and assay optimization. Buffer optimization and reagent titration can be set up very easily. A customer once called it assay development in an experiment. All of these features are a result of LabSite technology. I would encourage you to visit LabSite.com to learn more about the technology. My brief introduction really doesn't do it justice, but can help with understanding the features and potential utility for you. A transducer underneath the source well generates focused sound waves. First, to interrogate the well, similar to echolocation, the instrument sends and listens to three pins. The first to determine the bottom of the plate, the next to determine the bottom of the well and fluid interface, and a third to determine the bottom of the fluid meniscus. From these, the instrument is able to determine the fluid composition and volume in the well. Second, the transducer generates focused sound waves to generate the drop to be transferred. The sound energy is focused just below the meniscus. A mounting at the surface develops until the drop is pinched off from the surface. With the 555, the drop is 2.5 nanoliter in volume, and this is repeated to reach the desired transfer volume. This process is very consistent, reliable, and extremely precise, and can be repeated at 200 to 500 droplets per second. So again, there is no physical contact and touchless. It's eliminating tips and nozzles. Because the drop is ejected up, the destination plate is inverted, and surface tension and electrostatics hold liquid in place. The transfers can be either wet or dry. This technology is revolutionizing liquid handling. Compared to manual or old school liquid handlers, the inherent error, unreliability, calibration requirements, and cost of tips is eliminated. Yet Echo Platform maintains the flexibility of manual pipetting to create highly complex assays much faster and without RSI to the scientists. But it doesn't stop with liquid handling. The LabSite system is a family of complementary products, including consumables, automation, and software to streamline your workflow and process. The LabSite system is versatile and capable of addressing broad application needs, including assay requirements in genomics, proteomics, cell assays, as well as drug discovery. Again, I would point you to LabSite.com for additional information on the product line and applications. As an example, I wanted to share some work using the LabSite Echo Liquid Handler and the IntelliSite IQHD to run high-throughput, multiplex apoptosis assays. Apoptosis is the best characterized type of programmed cell death. Because of its importance in development and homeostasis and the pathogenesis of different diseases such as cancer, apoptosis has undergone extensive investigation in the past decades. During apoptosis, several changes affecting the plasma membrane, mitochondria, cytoplasm, or nucleus can be measured in apoptotic cells. One of the earliest events during apoptosis is the translocation of phosphatidylserine from the inner to outer leaflet of the plasma membrane that can be detected with an XN5. Mitochondrial dysfunction also occurs in apoptosis and is accompanied by a decreased membrane potential and the release of mitochondrial proteins such as cytochrome C and this leads to the activation of caspases and DNA fragmentation. Anexins are a family of calcium-dependent phospholipid-dependent phospholipid binding proteins, which bind to phosphatidylserine to identify apoptotic cells and healthy cells. Phosphatidylserine is predominantly located along the cytosolic side of the plasma membrane. Upon initiation of apoptosis, PS loses its asymmetric distribution in the phospholipid bilayer and translocates to the extracellular membrane. This is detectable with fluorescently labeled an XN5. Now, in early stages of apoptosis, the plasma membrane excludes viability dyes, such as propidium iodine and 7-AAD. Therefore, cells which display only an XN5 staining, that is PI 7-AAD negative, are in early stages of apoptosis. During late stage apoptosis, loss of cell membrane integral integrity allows an XN5 binding to cytosolic phosphatidyl series, as well as cell uptake of PI and 7-AAD. An XN5 staining paired with 7-AAD or PI 
is widely used to identify apoptotic stages by flow cytometry. A distinctive feature of the early stages of programmed cell death is the disruption of active mitochondria. The mitochondrial disrupt disruption includes changes in the membrane potential and alterations to the oxidation reduction potential of the mitochondria. Changes in the membrane potential allow passage of ions, small molecules, and certain fluorescent dyes. The resulting equilibration of ions leads, in turn, to the decoupling of the respiratory chain and the release of cytochrome C into the cytosol. Cytochrome C, which is a critical component of the electron transport chain, is a component of the functional apoptosome. Upon release from mitochondria, cytochrome C binds to the adapter proteins APAF1 and procaspase 9 to form a cytosolic complex. This event results in activation of procaspase 9 and its subsequent cleavage and activation of caspase 3. Now, this is a very important target class. The caspases are a family of cysteine proteases that cleave after certain spartate residues and are primarily recognized as mediators of apoptosis. Caspases are synthesized as inactive zymogens that can be cleaved to form active enzymes following the induction of apoptosis by stress or death receptors. Initiator caspases, for example, caspase 8 and 10, are activated by dimerization of the zymogen on a dedicated adapter protein. These activated initiator caspases in turn cleave downstream effector or executioner caspases, for example, caspase 3, 6, or 7. In a cascade-like manner, they cleave cellular proteins that lead to the morphological changes associated with apoptotic cell death. Intellicite Corporation's high-throughput flow technology is the first to enable screening suspension cells. The technology extends the capabilities of flow cytometry by increasing sample throughput far beyond current commercial offerings. The sampling method transfers assay components and solution, including cells, to the flow cytometer detector in a continuous air gap delimited stream. And this was highlighted in Helen's uh, slides earlier, and you can go back to those as needed. This novel method dramatically reduces the time required to analyze a microplate and the amount of sample required for analysis by eliminating the dead volume inherent in typical flow cytometry sampling and the associated single well data file storage. For example, a 1536 well plate can be sampled in 80 odd minutes. The multi-site four-plex apoptosis screening kit uses a unique set of four dyes that are matched to the detection capabilities of IntelliSight screening platforms. The activation of caspase 37 is detected by the use of caspase substrate that upon cleavage by activated enzyme, results in a fluorescent signal. SERP expression, surface expression of phosphatidylserine is detected by the binding of an exon 5. Cell viability is determined by the uptake of dye through compromised or porous membranes, while mitochondrial membrane potential is determined by a dye localizing mitochondrial lumen when mitochondria are healthy and able to maintain a membrane potential. Upon mitochondrial depolarization, the dye leaks into the cytoplasm and loses its ability to fluoresce. In the area of apoptosis testing, there's a wealth of methodologies for both research and screening applications. IntelliCite has developed a no-wash multi-site four-plex apoptosis screening kit that allows simultaneous detection of caspase 37 activation with the FL1 channel and XL5 binding in FL2. Cell viability is measured in FL3 and mitochondrial membrane polarization with FL4 all from a single sample. Additionally, cell count is an inherent capability of the platform and may be useful for identifying overtly toxic treatments. The multi-site fourplex apoptosis screening kit is the only kit commercially available that allows simultaneous detection of these four endpoints, enabling the ability to construct phenotypic apoptotic profiles for compounds of interest. Now, in this experiment, the, hum the adherent human JERCAT T-cell line is maintained at log growth phase in RPMI 1640. This is supplemented with 10% cosmic calf serum and glutamines maintained under standard conditions. Rapoptotic induction stores spore and nicotazole and camphothecin were diluted to the appropriate concentration in DMSO. 10-point dose response plates were prepared by direct dilution with the echo in duplicate to create assay-ready screening plates. Um, with the ECHO 555 liquid handler at 200x final assay concentration. This yielded a 0.5% DMSO uh, percentage on the cells. 100 nanoliters was used for 384 well plates and 25 nanoliter for the 1536 assay plates. Cells at 186 per mil were added with a thermo multi-drop combi reagent dispenser. 
using 20 microliters for the 384 well and 5 microliters for the 1536 well assay plates. These were incubated under standard conditions with appropriate plate controls. After a 24-hour incubation, the dye cocktail was added in a single addition of 1.15 microliters for 384 and 300 nanoliters for 1536 with the ECHO 525 liquid handler. After one hour incubation at room temperature, data was acquired using the IQ Screener HD. Data was processed using the foresight control and analysis software, and dose response analysis of data was fit with a full parameter logistic function using the GraphPad prism. So what we're looking at here is essentially the multi-site four plus apoptosis kit, looking at the 384 and a total volume of 20 microliters, and this is the output from the foresight control and analysis software. Up on the upper left, what we're doing is gating for all cellular activities. The panel to the right of that, we're looking at single cells gated. And in the panels below, we're seeing histograms for the various um, readouts. So on the left, we're looking at caspase plus cells in the single cell gate. The middle is an exon, an, an exon cell population. And we're looking at mitochondrial damage isolated in the far right panel. When we plot the 384 well data from the foresight uh, analysis software into GraphPad Prism, looking at dose response curves, we're developing some curves uh, shown here in four different panels. So on the left panel, we're looking at caspase. Uh, in light blue, in dark blue, it'll be the annexin curve. In light green is mitochondrial damage cells. And in the dark green, we have uh, cell number counted. We have representative curves for store sporin, ranging from micromolar down to picomolar concentrations and we're seeing nice dose responses for the cellular response. In this slide, we're looking at the 1536 well assay, which was run at a total volume of just over five microliters. And again, we have a similar breakdown of the data presentation from the foresight control software, where in the upper left panel, we're looking at all cells identified. We've gated that out in the panel to the right for single cells. And again, the bottom three panels are breaking the uh, cell populations down under the different channels for caspase in the left, uh, anexin is in the middle, and mitochondrial damaged isolated or identified cells are in the panel to the right. The dose response curves for the 1536 well data are shown in this slide here. And again, uh, we're looking at representative curves for storosporin in the same dose response generated from the same assay-ready uh, compound plates generated by the, five, the 555. Uh, the left light blue panel is the dose response curve for caspase. Uh, readout. The dark blue is an exon. The light green is going to be the mitochondrial damage again, and the cell count is represented in the far right panel uh, or far right curve. One thing I didn't point out during the 384 slide, and it can also be seen here in the 1536, is that the dose response curves generated here or shown here do include uh, error. The standard deviations are plotted with each data point. And as you can see, and if you go back to the 3D four wall plates, that the data really is quite tight. Uh, so the data generated um, as prepared by the ECHO and read on the IQHD is, is definitely um, quality data. What I've done is taken the compounds that I mentioned earlier and the assays that I mentioned earlier and put it into a tabular format. So I apologize for the busyness of the slide, but it can be broken down fairly simply. So I've got four different panels uh, the top panel is going to be the uh, potency estimates derived for the caspase 37 activation. The second panel is going to be the potency estimate table for an X and 5 binding phosphatidylserine. The bottom or the, the third panel is going to be mitochondrial membrane potential and those potency estimates, and cell count will be at the bottom. What I've included in each of the rows for each panel are the three compounds tested. That includes storosporin, nicotazole, and campitheson. And what I've done is include the columns for the 384 well assay uh, on the far left, the 1536, and then a subsequent assay as a replicate or technical replicate for the 1536 NF2. Because the data for the potency estimates were all so tight, I was able to average across these technical replicates for each of the compounds in this, the JERCAT cell lines and provide an average. The standard deviation is also included. Uh, for each of the different conditions tested, each of the different readouts tested, and each of the different plate formats that were tested. The final column on the far right are the nanomolar averages, and these correlate well to the uh, previously um, published results from, from IntelliSight. 
So the data is quite tied across uh, platforms. Well, I'll show that in the summary slide. So in summary, the multi-site apoptosis screening kit is validated using the ECHO liquid handler and the IQ screener HD. The ECHO enabled the total assay volume in 3D4 well to be reduced from 40 microliters to 24 microliters, resulting in time and reagent cost reduction. The assay was miniaturized in 1536 to less than 6 microliters, further increasing throughput. And compound dosing and dye additions with the ECHO liquid handler produced equivalent results in both the 3D4 well and 1536-well assay. These all correlated with IntelliSight published values. The miniaturization of assay volume and validation at higher density with the Echo Liquid Handler series maximizes the potential of high throughput flow with the IQ screener HD. And with that, I'd like to thank you and hand this back to Elisa. Thank you, Helen and John. At this time, we are going to open up for questions. Please type in your questions in the Q&A window and click send. Our first question is for LabSite. In addition to the apoptosis assay, what other types of assays have you miniaturized using the ECHO liquid handler? Well, we've miniaturized quite a few different types of assays across a variety of platforms uh, in quite a few different therapeutic areas. Uh, some of the first that are of high impact that come to mind uh, are in the genomic space. So we've miniaturized and had significant cost savings in qPCR reactions, NGS library preps, uh, as well as sequencing, say with big dye uh, assays, where we've been able to reduce the volume down to two microliters, and that has that saved quite a bit of time as well as cost to the, to the researcher. And in terms of the drug discovery and cancer research, uh, pretty much all of the fluorescent platforms were able to miniaturize down. Um, and this is a, another way to sort of go higher content, higher density, as well as reduce cost and increase the speed of the assay. There is one limitation that we might run into in terms of miniaturization. It's not that we can do all assays, and this might come up in terms of some of the luminescent platforms. And it's not so much a problem with miniaturizing the reagents and getting the transfers done. Typically, it's more a limitation of the readers and the sensitivities to pick up the uh, luminescent signal. Thank you, John. The next question is for IntelliSight. You mentioned in your presentation that the IQ screener can work with adherent cells. Could you explain how this is possible? Yes, uh, good question. So there's uh, various reagents that, uh, that allows you to lift the cells off the plate. So one of the reagents that we tested in-house is the Accutase reagent. So basically, you just after your staining protocol for your cells, you just add this reagent into your into your sample and let it incubate for a little while. Um, you, you don't even need to wash this reagent off the plate. Basically, you just add it in, incubate for a while, and put it put your plate on the system. The IQ screener actually has a built-in shaker, so you can actually put the plate onto the system and have it shake to lift the cells off the plate. Um, I think a few weeks ago, we actually gave a webinar on uh, working with adherent cells on the IQ, so please refer to our website to review that webinar. But yes, uh, it is possible to work with adherent cells on the system. The next question is also for IntelliSight. Since the IQ screener is continuously drawing sample, is carryover an issue? So carryover is uh, very minimum uh, on our system. Uh, we uh, tested it, it's about less than 1%. Uh, the air gap that generates between the sample, between the two samples, the air gap uh, actually pushes the sample through the system. So you really don't have to worry about too much of a carryover. We, and you can also program the system to say every X number of wells to rinse the probe. So that will further um, kind of uh, further prevent carryover between wells. And I've actually worked with bacteria samples on the system, and it was a very sticky uh, bacteria sample. So what we did was just program every, between every well, we rinsed the probe, and that kind of minimized the carryover between the, the two um, neighboring wells. Thank you, Helen. The next question is for LabSite. How does the echo liquid handler perform direct dilution of compounds, and is there a benefit for this over serial dilution? That, that's a great question, um, and this is something that's usually not realized until you actually have the echo in hand and you're able to, to see the benefits um, from this technique. So typically the serial dilution technique using pipettes, it, it's well established in the way to obtain a series of increasingly dilute solutions to understand the effect of dosing. However, 
The direct dilution provides a number of advantage over this serial dilution uh, procedure. In the lab site echo that the handlers use, the solutions are never in contact with the pipette tip, pin tool, or spray nozzle. And this eliminates the potential for both leachates and cross-contamination. So stock solution is transferred directly to the assay wells to generate the same concentrations obtained in serial dilutions. But because the amount of the stock solution is so small, the sample can be maintained in pure DMSO, and this helps to reduce the chance of sample precipitation during the during dilution. Now, a lot of people have gone to doing the serial or intermediate dilutions with DMSO, which is great, but you still run into some of the problems um, with serial dilution, in that compounding error is eliminated, some samples are not serial diluted, and you know, in general, significantly less samples used to generate the final concentration ranges. And really, direct dilution also generates less liquid and solid waste. This is something that's not typically realized or uh, appreciated uh, when, you, when you're going into this, this idea of just direct dilution. But there is a very large savings in terms of less liquid and solid waste generated. Uh, and this obviously reduces downstream expenses as well as increasing your uh, quality of data for dose response generation. Thank you, John. The next question is for IntelliSight. What kind of maintenance is required with the IQ? So the maintenance of the system is uh, very minimal. Uh, we recommend changing the probe after every 15 hours of usage. Uh, the probe is very easy to change and is relatively inexpensive. So there's a wizard that actually walks you through how to change the, change the probe. The sheaf buffer is just basically water with bacteriostatic. And then the decontamination solution and cleaning solution is just a stock concentration that you buy and you just dilute it down in, with water. Um, then when you turn on the IQ, there is a, a startup procedure that takes about 15 minutes. So it just, uh, the system runs through its cleaning cycle and also um, it makes sure um, that everything is working and warming up the laser and everything like that. And then at the end of the day, there is also a shutdown procedure and basically, once you initiate that shutdown procedure, you can basically walk away from the system. Um, you don't need to wait for the system to go through its complete shutdown procedure before you can go home for the end of the day. So the maintenance is very, very minimal on the IQ. The next question is for lab site. Um, during the presentation, you, um, you used two echoes. Can you explain the use of the two echoes? Uh, sure. Um, this was done on purpose, and it was done to provide a platform for a sort of next set of uh, experiments and to highlight some of our newer um, upgrades in terms of our automation platform. So what we could have done was simply use the 555 and run the entire assay uh, from, from start to finish. But the idea of using the 555 and then the 525 in order to dispense the, uh, the larger reagent dispense uh, the idea behind that was to now highlight the ability to run um, dual echoes on our access lab laboratory automation system. So it's a very good uh, software upgrade and automation upgrade in that we are now able to sort of increase the flow and enhance your work, uh, workflow and process to get a higher throughput uh, yield from the assay. So while one echo is running doing compound dilutions, your downstream effects or downstream processes aren't affected and you're still able to continue in a miniaturized fashion with a dual echo system. And we have one um, last question. It's for um, Helen at Telesite. When you multiplex multi-cell types and multiple beads in one well, how does that affect the sampling speed? So actually it doesn't affect the sampling speed whatsoever on the system. So even if you're doing a 20-plex assay or a single-plex assay, it's the same sampling speed and time. So it really doesn't matter if you multiplex or do a single plex assay. Thank you, Helen, and uh, thank you, John, for answering uh, those questions today. We've reached the end of today's webinar. There is a short survey which can, you can find at the bottom of the screen. It's the widget to the right of the Q&A widget. Please take a short moment to complete the survey. You will also receive a follow-up email that will include a link to access today's recorded session. Thank you again for attending today's webcast.